Thank you all for coming this morning. Thank you so much for coming. We've got about 5,000 people here. And when I checked just before I came on, we've already got tens of thousands watching the streaming broadcast all around the world. We're streaming all the way up to a megabit per second all around the world. And we had over three gigabits per second of streaming data going out when I checked just before I came out. We have a lot of people watching today. The last several months of 2000 were particularly challenging for Apple and our industry. We decided to start 2001 with a bang. We got a lot of incredible stuff to show you today. <laughs> So let's get started. First thing I want to talk about today, Mac OS X. <laughs> Mac OS X. Let me review the architecture of Mac OS X for those of you who don't know. Architecture is in four layers. A kernel called Darwin, the most killer graphics ever, tremendous frameworks for developers to write to, and a stunning new user interface called Aqua. Darwin. Darwin's pretty amazing. Of course, it has protected memory so it doesn't crash. And our goal is to never have Darwin crash. It's got virtual memory, so it manages the memory for you. No more setting the amount of memory each app's going to get. It does it all for you. Preemptive multitasking, so if you're working on something, something else can't block you. Multi-threading, so again, you can juggle activities very easily. Symmetric multi-processing, so when you throw in a second processor, things accelerate automatically. And BSD Unix services, so you can talk to enterprise systems. You know, most of the servers in enterprises are Unix-based, and we are their twin brother. And it's fully open source. So we have a Linux-like community that's already built up around Darwin, and matter of fact, helped us quite a bit. We've already incorporated a lot of their feedback and work into Darwin. So that's the architecture of Darwin. Now we move on to graphics. We've got three levels of graphics, 2D, 3D, and multimedia. In 2D, we have Quartz, which is remarkable. Quartz is based on the PDF internet standard. It does PDF rendering on the fly, fully anti-aliased, supports all the standard fonts out there, compositing transparency. It's incredibly fast and incredibly stunning. We move on to 3D, OpenGL, industry standard. It's great for games, but it's also great for professional imaging. And we're starting to use it more and more for very high-end stuff as well. Hardware acceleration optimized for the G4, OpenGL. And of course, QuickTime, we've based it on the latest version of QuickTime, QuickTime 5. We've integrated it into the OS so it can take advantage of the advanced plumbing. And of course, we have a new player interface as well. So we've got the most killer graphics on the planet built in right to the core of Mac OS X. Frameworks, we have three frameworks, Classic, Carbon, and Cocoa. Classic, of course, runs existing Mac OS 9 apps as is. Almost all Mac OS 9 apps just run in Mac OS X without any modification. And it's pretty remarkable. But you don't get the core advantages of Mac OS X. To do that, developers have to tune up their apps for Carbon. Takes them a few months, and they produce an app that springs to life in Mac OS X, taking advantage of all its new features. And this is what all of our developers are working on doing now. Plus, we've got an extraordinarily advanced object-oriented API called Coco, which is the coolest thing out there for writing new apps. And you can write apps 10 times faster than any, any other technology we know of in the industry. So we've got killer APIs for our developers, and we're supporting full Java 2 as well in Mac OS X. Those are our frameworks. And a stunning new user, user interface called Aqua, which I will show you more of in just a second. So that's the architecture for Mac OS X. We just finished our beta release. We released a beta release of Mac OS X last September. And I can report to you now, it's been a stunning success for us. We anticipated about 10,000 people buying the beta. We had 100,000. 100,000 copies of the beta have been sold. We anticipated 3,000, 4,000 individual feedback submissions. We've had over 75,000, some of them quite long. And, 
We've read every single one, we've categorized them, and we've learned a lot from this, and it's helped make Mac OS X better. So I thank you guys who've sent those feedback submissions, and we're going to get a much better OS because of your help. I went into the database and pulled some things out to characterize three kinds of feedback for you. The first was positive feedback. We always like a little positive feedback. And the most, uh, the most frequent positive feedback was far more stable. This thing is, in beta form, far more stable than even OS 9 is in shipping form. And we're very gratified to hear that. Second, Aqua is incredible. People in general loved Aqua. There's a few things they'd like to see changed, but in general they loved it. Super easy to install. We nailed the installation. Classic really works. I think people were really surprised that we could run Mac OS 9 apps in Mac OS 10, and it works well. And a really interesting one, a lot of feedback that Mac plus Unix is a whole new ball game for Apple. That this is taking the power of Unix and marrying it with the legendary ease of use and advanced application platform of the Mac and producing something that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world that people are really excited about. The second area of feedback was missing features. A lot of missing features. The number one one was airport, surprisingly. Printing, location manager, etc. These are features that just didn't make it into the beta. Airport missed it by about two weeks. I'm pleased to report that all these features are now in the OS, as well as many others that we just uh, didn't have at beta. And the last category was key concerns. People had some key concerns, and the most frequent ones were the Apple menu, clock in the menu bar, disks on the desktop control strip, and the finder toolbar is awfully big and horsey. So we listen to these concerns very carefully. And if you've noticed, Mac OS X has been evolving all throughout 2000 based on feedback that we've gotten from our developers and our users, and we're not stopping. And we've added some new features in Mac OS X, and I would like to show them to you right now. One that nobody asked for, but we added anyway, was uh, this new screensaver. It's kind of cool. It, uh, it goes and finds all your icons and uh, makes a cool screensaver. But let me show you one other thing that's kind of neat. Uh, we have another one in here. Whoops, I didn't want that. Uh, we have another one in here, um, which... Uh, you can own pictures in, and it will go ahead using OpenGL and uh, uh, dissolve, cross dissolve and zoom them into each other. And it's really beautiful. So I threw some pictures of a beach up here, but you can have pictures of your family or your dog or you know our products or whatever you want. Uh, but it's really nice, something you've never seen on a computer before. And it turns your computer into this most gorgeous digital picture frame when you're not using it. All right. Uh, we'd all like to be there. So, uh, I'm going to run through a few things very quickly, just in case some of you have never seen Mac OS X. As you know, you can move windows around real time, not just the outlines. They resize real time, as you've seen before. Uh, and one of the things that uh, has really worked out well has been sheets. As you know, in Mac OS today, when uh, the OS wants to tell you something, it throws up a panel, which can get disconnected from the window that it applies to. It gets very strange when you start to work on many applications at once and you don't know which window the panel applies to. We've gone to what we call sheets. When the OS wants to interact with you on a document basis, it throws up a sheet and you can interact with it, in this case, a save panel. Very simple. When your window gets very small, it goes like this. And as you can see, it even moves away from the side if you're too close to the edge. Okay? Very, very simple. And I guess Sheets also illustrates something we're trying to do with Mac OS X that's really important to us. To make it more powerful, yet at the same time, easier to use. And that's a tall order to do both of those at the same time. So here we have a save panel that's the simplest save panel you've ever seen. You name the document, and you pop down a list, and you tell it where you want to save it. Couldn't be simpler. But what if where you want to save it isn't in this list? Well, in that case, you, Advanced user just pops this up, and they can traverse the whole file system right here and say they want to put it here, they want to put it in documents, and they just add to, they can, you know, anywhere else in the file system they want to go, they can add anything to favorites as well, or replace a favorite, and uh, very, very simple. So we have complexity, 
and we have simplicity built into the OS at the same time. Now, we also have the dock down here. And the dock, as you know, is a great place to put applications, and it's a great place to put documents. So, as an example, I can grab some more apps and drag them down into the dock. And as you know, you can see the dock just shrinks as we add more to it. I can also minimize things into the dock. Right now on the Mac OS, when you minimize things, it's not the perfect experience to get that window shade. It kind of clutters up your screen. Here, again, things minimize right into the dock. I'll get another picture up. And again, just minimize them right into the dock. They come up right where you left them. If you've never seen this in slow-mo before, let me just show you in slow-mo. So you can see the production value of which this happens at. It's pretty wonderful. OK. Now, one other thing that the dock allows for us to do is uh, we can set its size. So I'll go to System Preferences here, and I can set the dock size to be as large as it can be, or I can even set it to be smaller. So at a maximum, it will be this size. But when the dock gets small, if I want to grab something really fast, it might be hard to see. So I can turn on magnification, just like this. Right? Isn't that nice? And I can even hide the dock if I don't want to see it. And when I bring it up, it'll just come up when I move to the bottom of the screen like this. Very simple, very unobtrusive. It's pretty wonderful. OK, that is the dock. Now, what I'm going to do now is bring up a QuickTime movie and just show you one other fun thing about the dock. This is a movie trailer here. Let me just uh, bop into where we get a little action. Watch this. The story of a warrior. See anything? The woman he loved. A daring outlaw. The dock has become very active. And a princess destined to become a warrior. So, the dock has become a very active place where applications can even go as far as play movies. They can show status, they can communicate with you in any way that they choose. All right. Now, let's get into some of the fun new stuff. I am going to take a folder, and uh, what I think I'm going to do is uh, go to my home directory here and take my pictures folder, and I'm going to move it down into the dock. Now, normally I can go down into the dock and I can click on this and see my pictures folder. Really fast way to get to folders. But we've added something new based on people's feedback uh, of wanting the functionality of the Apple menu. I can go down here and click and hold and get a pop-up of everything in that folder. Okay. I can even go to applications and get a click and get all my documents. Boom. There we go. So everything I've got in here, I can have multiple folders and drag stuff out. Well, how far does this go? Well, let me show you the ultimate. I can drag my hard disk down here. Right? I'll put it over here. That's my hard disk. I can go to Users, Avi, Pictures, bring up a picture. All righty. Thank you for these suggestions. They came from our users. Now, we've taken the Apple menu that used to be in the center of the screen, and we've moved it over to the left where it was. But we've changed it a bit. You know, right now when people think of Mac OS, they think of the Finder, don't they? Because you have to go to the Finder to do everything. You have to go to the Finder to even sleep, as an example, to quit. Everything's done through the Finder. And we see the Finder as just another app. You know, there may be multiple Finders someday. Some beginners may never even use the Finder. With email, you don't have to go to the Finder to find your email, right? So documents can manage their own files and present them to users in much more intuitive ways than a file system. And so we're going to be moving in that direction over time. And to take the first step, 
we've taken out a few of the features that you always have to go to the finder to get. Like when you're in an application and you want to go to sleep or you want to quit or you want to log out, all you have to do now is go to the Apple menu. And we've got sleep, restart, shutdown, and log out from anywhere in the system. You no longer have to go back to the finder. We all recent items, of course, right here, all your recent items, uh, documents, applications, etc. We've moved the location manager up here, so you have all your locations right here, if you've got lo multiple locations set up. And you can, we, you can turn magnification and auto hide for the dock off and on, as well as get dock preferences or system preferences right from the menu up here. So that's the new Apple menu. Uh, New font panel, we got a lot of feedback that the font panel was too big. Well, one of the things we've done in the font panel is we've gone out and licensed some incredible new fonts. And as you know, we have collections of fonts, so we have some fun modern fonts here, uh, copper plate, and you'll notice things, of course, in the font panel, change documents in real time. Oops, a little too big there. Change documents in real time. Helvetica, Futura, copper plate, Dito. We've got some great classics here, Caslon you know, Gil Sands, and some fun fonts as well. Really great stuff here. Now, about the font panel, back to that. So we've made the font panel, so if you shrink it down, look what happens. You just get pop-ups, and you can even get rid of collections to where your font panel is very, very small, and you can leave it up all the time and do whatever you want with it. So that's the font panel. Last but not least, toolbars. We got a lot of feedback that the toolbars on the Finder and the other apps were just too big. We've made them dramatically smaller, as you can see here on the Finder. But we also got a lot of feedback that people wanted a status bar. We've allowed you to add a status bar here, show number of items, show how much space you have left on the disk if you want. So you can show and hide that. But the biggest piece of feedback we got was that different users wanted different things on the toolbars, whether it be in the Finder or Mail or Preferences, etc. And so we've made them all customizable. So you can go in and you can say, customize the toolbar, and we'll give you a range of things you might want to do here. I want to bring my movies up here. I want to bring the path up here. I want to move this over here. And uh, maybe I'll bring music up here too. Right? I'll even put customize up there. And I can view things, I can view things as icon and text, or I can view them as icon only, or I can even view them as text only if I wanted to, but I like both. And so here's my new toolbar. And again, I've got my views right here, and I've also got my path right here if I want to get back anywhere. Right? And of course I can even go customize right from here. So I've got everything I want right there. And of course, I can e oops, done. And of course. Uh, I can even hide my toolbar, right? But we've got something even more fun. We got a lot of feedback that people love the new Finder, but they all, some of them also love the old Finder. So let me go back here, back to computer, and uh, let me navigate here to Users, and I'm going to go into Avi again, and I'm going to go into Pictures, and I'm going to open a picture. Now this is how the Finder works in Mac OS X, and it doesn't litter your screen with a lot of windows. But if you want to litter your screen with a lot of windows, I'll just open it from the hard disk here. Whenever the toolbar is closed, and you click on something, it spawns a window. And so you can have it any way you want it. If you want it to work exactly like the old Finder, you got it. Okay, so that is Mac OS X. Again to review, new Apple menu, a lot of stuff on preferences, recent items, the ability to instantly go to sleep or log out from anywhere in the system. The dock, pop-up, Menus right off the folders and off applications, listing all the open documents. The new toolbars, dramatically smaller, completely configurizable, customizable, and even hideable to where the windows work just like they did in Mac OS 9, spawning windows every time you go down a level. This 
is some of the features we've added to Mac OS X. Now let's move on to applications. Because the minute we ship Mac OS X, of course the mantra is going to be carbonized applications, carbonized application. Again, when we go into frameworks, it's not the classic apps we're talking about because those all just run. So we have thousands of apps that run on Mac OS X from day one. But we're talking about the carbonized and Cocoa apps that take full advantage of all the Mac OS X features. So how are we doing on that? As of today, we have 400 developers committed, which represent over 1,200 brand name apps that are being worked on for release on Mac OS X. Of those, 350 of them have been announced to date. That includes the 100 that are being announced this week alone. Now the apps, the apps are going to come out over a time period. They're going to come out in a bell curve. We're going to have hundreds coming out this spring. The majority of them, the avalanche of them, is going to come out this summer. You can imagine Macworld July is going to be the coming out party for a lot of Mac OS X apps. And then we're going to have some laggards in the fall. So it's going to follow this bell curve. I'd like to show you one now that's coming out this spring that's amazing. It is probably the largest Mac app ever. It's actually larger than Mac OS X. And that is Alias Wavefront's Maya. So, we've been working closely with the Maya team. They're excellent. And I'd like to invite Richard Karras up on stage to show us Maya running on Mac OS X. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Alias Wavefront customers are some of the most creative people on the planet. Let's take movies, for example. Last year, all of the films nominated for the Special Effects Academy Award used Maya, our 3D product for animation. As a matter of fact, 26 of the top 50 films of all time used Alias Wavefront products. And these images that you see here used Maya. Maya is for 3D, what Photoshop is for 2D. Now, Maya is a very sophisticated application. It has modeling, rendering, animation. It's got a full dynamic system. It's also got paint. It is the best tool for the film, video, games, and visual web markets. But all that power puts a lot of demand on the operating system. And I'm happy to tell you that the Mac OS X is performing like a champ. The combination of a G4, Maya, OS 10 is going to be awesome. Now, this is our very first Macworld, and we're really excited to be here. And uh, we're just going to be able to give you a glimpse of our product here today, because we're going into beta in four weeks, and we're shipping this product next quarter. And we can't wait to take the creative professionals from the Apple marketplace and bring them into our world of 3D. Now, with me today is Dan Pressman. And we're going to show you just a little bit of the kinds of things that you can do with Maya on Mac OS X. Dan? Thanks, Richard. So the first thing I want to show you is how dynamics work in Maya. I'm going to show you a dynamic simulation here. We've got a wrecking ball set up above this stack of boxes. And you can see if I hit play, what I've done is simply said that I want gravity to affect the scene. You can see that as that swings down, it makes contact with the boxes, and we get a realistic dynamic simulation. Now I can stop that. I can scrub it backwards. We can see how that would form in reverse. And you can see we get really great interactive performance. I can also zoom in and tumble around this in real time. Now, isn't that awesome? That's the Dynamics Engine. That's the same Dynamics Engine that was used in Star Wars Episode One for the pod race sequence. The whole thing was done using our Dynamics Engine. And we can use that dynamics throughout our application. But one of the things that's really key to us is the workflow. Workflow is king. And for us to take the 2D artists into our 3D world, we want to bring that kind of familiar workflow. So we have this technology called Maya Paint Effects, where you don't only just paint on a 3D object, you can actually create 3D objects by painting. So next up, let's show you some of the Maya Paint Effects. Thanks again, Richard. Here we have another scene that I've set up. This is a little, little valley here. We've got some mountains and a lake. And I can just use paint effects to paint fully rendered plants directly into the scene. So you can see here we get real-time shadows. We're able to paint these in. You can see they actually grow as plants would. 
and we're able to actually animate that. Here you can see we have hundreds of different brushes that ship with the product. So you can see I can paint these in, and they all vary themselves randomly. So we can have subtle variations in color and shape, and all of these brushes can also contain animation. So you can see how quickly I can add these. You can see we can also use paint effects to do other types of uh, paint brushes. So for example, I can just add clouds to the sky here. And you can see that they get painted in 3D behind the mountains. They behave properly. And again, all of these brushes can contain animation. I've gone ahead and rendered this out to QuickTime. And let's just take a look at how this looks in motion. Thank you. So, so there you have a glimpse of what is Maya. We invite you to come by our booth. We're going to have our customers there, some from Industrial Light and Magic, Digital Domain. They'll be showing the stuff that they do with Maya, and we'll be showing a lot more of Maya on Mac OS X. So thank you very much, Steve. Isn't that awesome? OK. So Maya is one of the apps that's coming out in the spring along with hundreds of others. The avalanche will happen this summer with some laggards in the fall. I think we've got a great, great lineup of applications coming out for Mac OS X this year. So let's get to schedule. When can I buy Mac OS X? You will be able to buy Mac OS X at your favorite channel partner on Saturday, March 24th in store. We're going to be shipping. We are taking the last several weeks to make sure this thing is absolutely solid. We're feeling very, very good about it right now. Saturday, March 24th. Price, $129. So March 24th, you'll be able to buy your copy of Mac OS X. Now, as I said earlier, the apps will come in in a bell curve over the course of the year. We're going to be shipping Mac OS X right at the beginning of this bell curve. The avalanche of apps will happen this summer. And that's when we've decided to bundle Mac OS X on our systems, to preload it on our systems, is when the avalanche of apps starts to happen. So we will be preloading starting this July on all of our systems as the default OS. And you will be able to buy your copy starting Saturday, March 24th. And that is the schedule for Mac OS X. And we know that Mac OS X is really laying the foundation for the next decade, decade and a half of our software efforts. And we think we've got something really, really good here. And I hope you love it as much as we do starting on March 24th. OK, Mac OS X. What's next? Power Mac G4. Today, we're launching a whole new generation of Power Mac G4s. And the theme, the theme of this new generation is power to burn. Power to burn. Of course, the G4 is based on the G Power PC G4 chip. And you all know, as much as I, that we've been Coasting along at 500 megahertz now for almost 18 months. That's too long, isn't it? So today, we're taking it up to 733. <laughs> this is a new generation G4 chip that's delivering over five and a half gigaflops of sustained performance. It's amazingly fast. And we're gonna have four models of G4s. Four models. Now, what do they all have in them? They all have a few things in them, so let me go through that first. They all have CD-read-write drives in them to start with. <laughs> we're late to this party, but we're here, even at the entry-level systems. CD-read-write standard in all models. We've got a new architecture in this machine that's really fast. 133 megahertz system and memory buses. We're getting over a gigabyte per second of sustained internal bandwidth in these systems. 
AGP4X for graphics, to get the fastest graphics systems possible with right combining, which is very important as well. And we're going to be adding NVIDIA graphics cards. We're going to be adding NVIDIA graphics cards in the top three models, GeForce 2MX standard in the top three models, AGP4X in all models. All models also have a new audio system in them with a 10 watt integrated digital amplifier, gigabit ethernet on the motherboard, and all models now have five slots. <laughs> Now, in addition to the five slots, we've made the PCI bus a lot faster. We've taken out the bridge and some other things, and it's dramatically faster. Now, five slots, we've been under, we've been short selling ourselves. We've been telling the world we had three slots, but the whole PC world counts the graphics slot as well. And so, the way everybody else counts slots, we've had four slots. We are upping the AGP to 4X, and we are adding a fourth PCI slot so that every Power Mac now has five slots. And every new Power Mac is completely OS X ready, fully configured and certified to be a great Mac OS X machine. So four models, 466 megahertz up to 733. They are single processor machines. Why? Because if we wanted to wait to get enough 733s to make dual processors, we'd be talking to you in April instead of today. And we want to get these out to you as fast as we can so they are single processor machines. However, we will be offering the 533 in a dual processor configuration that you or your channel partners can buy from Apple as a BTO config. But the standard configs are going to be single processor machines. So what are they? Processors 466 to 733. 128 megabytes in the low end, all the way up to 256 in the high end. 30 to 60 gigabyte drives. Rage 128 in the low end. GeForce 2MX in the top three configs. CD read write across the line. And here's the prices: 1699 to 3499. Now, hmm, what's this? What's this thing called a super drive? Well, this is huge. This is an industry first today. We've never seen anything like this before. <laughs> and it's a big deal. So, there are two kinds of optical drives today. Those that deal with CDs and those that deal with DVDs. A drive that reads CDs is called a CD-ROM drive. We're all familiar with that. That's what ships in most of the entry-level computers today. We've been shipping a drive called a DVD-ROM drive, which reads DVDs and CDs. But we missed something last year called the CD-ROM or CD-read-write drive, which reads and writes CDs. You can't read DVDs, but a whole lot of people were willing to make that trade-off so they could write CDs. And it's been huge. Now, some people still want to read DVDs as well, so there's going to be some drives coming out this summer called combo drives that do all three of these. They read and write CDs and they read DVDs. But what about this last quadrant? That's right. <laughs> That's called DVDR. That's the ability to write a DVD with data and video, but video that can be that DVD can be played on a consumer DVD player. Now, we think this is so important, but we don't want to give up the rest of it. We think CD read writes important too. So we have been working with our partner Pioneer to come up with a drive that does all of these things, that reads and writes data and audio on CDs, and reads and writes data and video on DVDs that can be played in consumer players, just like the CD audio disc can be played in consumer players. And that drive is called the Super Drive. And it's a really big deal. 
and this is an industry first. Now, the SuperDrive, a drive that could write DVDs, that could be read on consumer players, yesterday cost $5,000 for the drive alone. Starting today, it is bundled in with every new 733 megahertz power Mac, where you get the whole computer and the super drive for $34.99. So, the new power Mac G4s have the power to burn CDs, DVDs, oh yeah, and Pentiums too. So, Well, is that really so? What about this Pentium 4 thing? We're at 733 megahertz, they're at one and a half gigahertz. Do we have the power to burn them? Let's find out. <laughs> Phil, I'd like to bring Phil Schiller out, our Vice President of Product Marketing. Bill, morning, tell us Steve. what we have here today. Morning, everyone. Well, we've got a heavyweight matchup in the top left-hand corner of the ring. We've got the newest Power Mac G4 running at 733 megahertz, a spelt 733 megahertz. And in the right, we've got what people believe is the heavyweight champion, the new guy in the block, the brand new Intel Pentium 4, and it's got 1.5 gigahertz. I mean, that thing must just scream. So we're gonna put these things in a heavyweight battle. And I think you know the best to use to test the stuff is the app our customers use the most to run their machines and run their business. Of course, that's Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop 6. We're gonna run those side by side on these two machines. And of course, to make it fair, they run the same file, they have the same amount of memory. And with Photoshop, we can script through a bunch of actions that a real artist goes through in their job every day to get their work done. So let's see who gets the job done the fastest. Our Steve? customers do this dozens and dozens of times a day. All righty. You ready? Yes, let's bring up Photoshop. Now we're going to go through a 110 megabyte file with over 140 artist actions given to us by an artist for an actual movie poster they created. All right, so count, count it down, three, Phil. Three, two, one, go. We recognize this movie, a recent movie. We're bringing in multiple layers. We're using a bunch of transforms. We're adjusting color levels. We're moving and merging layers. Starting to blend them together using opacity and lighting effects, and the Mac is done. All right, gigahertz and a half is done. The undisputed champion, still reigning champion, Power Mac. Thanks, Thank Bill. You. We've We've got a half a dozen of these things we can show you if we want, but every time we run them, the 733 toasts the gigahertz and a half Pentium. 24 seconds in this case for the G4 versus 36 seconds for the Pentium running at a gigahertz and a half. The G4 is 33% faster. Now this highlights the megahertz myth, because when you compare megahertz from one processor family to another, it's like comparing apples and oranges, so to speak. And, it, and they don't compare. If we wanted to put everything into Intel megahertz, because the 733 is 33% faster, we'd have to call it a two gigahertz processor. And if you can see that this megahertz thing has gotten out of hand. What matters is how fast the machines are. So we've got the power to burn CDs, DVDs, and Pentiums. Now I'd like to show you something pretty cool. The power to burn, in most cases, if you want to burn a CD on most computers, you've got to run really bizarre utilities, these toast things and this and that. It's very strange. So I want to show you 
what we've come up with for Mac OS 9, and of course the same thing will be in Mac OS 10, to actually burn a CD. So the first thing I've got, a, my G4 here, I'm going to just stick in a blank CDR disk. And the drive takes about eight seconds to figure out that it's a blank CD disk. And what it's going to do is it's going to ask me what I want to title it, and I'll call it Macworld, and how I want to format it, and I'll just say prepare it. And see, it put it right on my desktop there, just like a regular old disk. And I click on it, and I get a folder, just like a regular old folder. And if I want to burn something in it, I just drag a file or two or whatever I want in it. <laughs> right? And see, we, we very much appreciate the applause, but you shouldn't be applauding because this is how it ought to work. <laughs> and you close this, and you can go up and burn the disk right here in the menu, or when you drag it to the trash, it just asks you, do you want to burn the disk? Right? In this case, I'll say no, I just want to discard it. All right, so that's how you burn CDs in Mac OS 9 and Mac OS 10. <clears throat> the power to burn CDs, DVDs, and Pentium, Power Mac G4. Availability. We have four models, 466 to 733. The bottom two are available immediately. The top two will be available in volume in February. Now, we're probably not going to have enough of the 733s to meet demand this quarter. So if you want one, get your order in with your dealer early. Power Mac G4. We got some accessories for it as well. Remember, we have a whole new audio system built in. We're going to be selling some pro speakers. Our new audio system, 10 watt digital amplifier, we have hardware EQ, great signal and noise, and these new speakers are going to sell for $59 in the channel. They're gorgeous, and they're available today. In addition, we've got an awesome 15 inch flat panel display to complement our 22 inch cinema display. The 15 inch display is, is truly wonderful to work with. It's powered from the computer, so you don't have the power bricks and the extra cables. It's got dual USB ports, you can plug your keyboard into it. It was $999, as of now, it's $799. So, our new Power Mac G4s have the power to burn. What's next? We're just getting started. I'd like to tell you where we're going. What is our vision? A lot of people have come to ask that of our whole industry in the last few months. What is our vision? <laughs> this is what everybody else is telling us. That our PC is waning, if not the hole being dug. One of the smartest journalists in our business is a guy named Walt Mossberg, somebody I admire, because he cares about the same things we do. And even Walt, a few weeks ago, said, the PC, which has carried the digital revolution for 24 years, has matured into something boring. That hurt. <laughs> but Walt's really smart, and we listen to him very carefully. Mike Capellas, who runs Compaq, we don't think of it in terms of the PC business anymore. Hmm. And Jeff Whiteson, who runs Gateway. We're clearly migrating away from the PC as the centerpiece. This is where this comes from. A lot of people wondering what the future of the PC is. We don't think the PC is dying at all. We don't think the PC is moving away from the center at all. We think it's evolving, just like it has since it was invented in 1975 and 6. You know, in the early years, nobody knew what this thing was going to do. These were the prehistoric era. But right around 1980, the PC entered what was to become its first golden age, and that was the age of productivity. With the invention of the personal computer spreadsheet and word processors, followed up a few years later in Apple's case by desktop publishing, 
The golden age of productivity had begun, and it lasted almost a decade and a half, driving this industry. The last few years, though, of that golden age, things started to flatten out. People started to wonder, is the PC waning? Have we solved all the problems that need to be solved with a PC? But right around the mid-90s, we entered the second golden age of the PC. And that, of course, was the age of the Internet. Now, we didn't throw out our productivity, we kept using it. But we added to it this exciting new thing called the Internet. And the Internet propelled the PC both in business and personal uses to new highs. And it's been amazing what's happened with the Internet. But now, as the Internet has matured, people are again asking, is the PC waning? What's going to happen to the PC? We think the PC is on the threshold of entering its third great age. And that age is the age of digital lifestyle. And that's being driven by an explosion of new digital devices. We have cell phones everywhere. We have portable music players, CDs and their cousins, the new solid state MP3 players now, everywhere. We have digital camcorders everywhere. We have DVD players exploding in consumers' homes and in business as well, even portable DVD players. Digital cameras now constitute 15% of all cameras sold in the U.S. 15%. It'll be 50% in a few years. And handheld organizers are everywhere as well. We are living in a new digital lifestyle with an explosion of digital devices. It's huge. And we believe the PC, or more importantly, the Mac, can become the digital hub of our new emerging digital lifestyle with the ability to add tremendous value to these other digital devices. Digital hub, key phrase. Now, how can the PC add such value? Why? Well, for a few reasons. One, because it can run complex applications. These devices can't. They don't have enough horsepower. Two, because the PC's got a big screen on it. That doesn't just mean you can see more information. It means we can make much better user interfaces. Most of these digital devices have pretty brain-dead UIs. We can burn disks, as we've seen with CDs and now DVDs. The digital devices can't do that. And we have large, inexpensive storage. You haven't paid a fortune for one of these little flash cards for your camera, you know what I mean. These are some of the things the PC can contribute. It also gets on the internet every way at every speed. Very few of our digital devices get on the internet at all, and those that do are slow. And so this is why we believe the PC will be the hub not just adding value to each of these devices, but interconnecting them as well as a digital hub. Now, we first began to understand this with the camcorder because we invented an application called iMovie that added tremendous value to a camcorder. If you've used iMovie, it makes your digital camcorder worth 10 times as much because you can convert raw footage into an incredible movie with transitions, cross dissolves, credits, soundtracks. You can convert raw footage that you'd normally never look at again on your camcorder into an incredibly emotional piece of communication. Professional, personal. It's amazing. You can even then take that iMovie and send it out over a Mac to Apple's website and we'll host it for you and stream it to any PC in the world. You can't do that with a camcorder. And we saw that the benefit here was a combination of a bunch of things. It was hardware, the computer and other hardware, the operating system, the application, the internet, and marketing to create this solution. In the case of iMovie, it was not only the Mac, but Firewire that allowed us to bring in the digital uh, video with pristine quality. It was QuickTime in the OS and the codecs and some real-time stuff. It was iMovie, a major application. On the internet, it was the internet itself plus Apple's homepage application, which lets you build a homepage to stream your movie on in five minutes. And a lot of marketing to create the solution of desktop movies. So we thought this was very important, and it took all these components, and we realized 
that Apple is uniquely suited to do this because we're the last company in this business that has all these components under one roof. We think it's a unique strength. And we discovered this with iMovie 2, that it could make a digital device called the camcorder worth 10 times as much. It's 10 times more valuable to you. So what are we going to focus on next? Audio, audio, CD players. There is a music revolution happening right now. Now music revolution is digital music on computers. So for those of you that are not participating in this, let me describe it to you. What do you want to do? Well, you want to rip your audio CDs onto your computer disk. Now what's rip mean? Well, for those of us over 30, it means read and encode. It means you stick your CD, your audio CD, onto your drive, your computer reads it, and then it encodes it or compresses it down to about a tenth of its original size and puts it on your hard disk. And when it compresses it, the format of choice to use is called MP3. It's a very dense format, it's very high quality, and it's open. So it compresses your music down into MP3 files off your, off your CDs, puts it on your disk. And then it allows you to create playlists of your favorite songs. I want a song from this album, a song from this album, a song from this album, three from that album. Put them together in a playlist, rearrange the order, and listen to them in any order I want. The music compiled the way I want, not the way some record company wants. And I can listen to my playlists on my computer. A lot of us spend hours a day on the computer. You want this to run in the background and let you listen to music while you're working. And now the big one. You want to be able to take those playlists and burn them on a custom audio CD. Burn means, for those of us over 30, write. You want to write a CD and play it on your CD player, your portable CD player, your CD player in your car, anywhere. And people are doing this like crazy. They're doing it like crazy. They're making all these compilations, drive to work music, workout music, this music, that music, hot date music. Now. How much are they doing it? How many blank CDs were sold in this country alone in the calendar year 2000? Take a guess. You know how many? 320 million. The US Census came out two weeks ago, 281 million people. <laughs> 320 million blank discs sold in the US, and they're getting down to 25 cents a piece. People are buying them in 100 packs. So it's amazing, this digital music revolution. Burn your seat playlists onto custom CDs. You also may want to transfer your songs to portable MP3 players, right? They're really handy too. And lastly, there's about, there's hundreds now internet radio stations that you may want to tune into and listen to internet radio stations. So these are the kinds of things you might want to do in this new music revolution. And there are some products out there, these music players that do some of that. The first one from Real Networks, this is Real Jukebox. It's the most popular right now. Gives you uh, the ability to do most of those things if you want to poke around. Some free advertising down in the corner. Here's one from Microsoft, the Windows Media Player. And here's one from Music Match that HP OEMs for their machines. Now if you look at these things, there's something that pops out right away. Especially if you're not already using one. They are too complex. They're really difficult to learn and use. I've talked to so many people using them that don't even know three-fourths of the features because they're too complicated. And they have restrictions. Some of them don't let you encode into MP3, which is the most popular format. Most of them limit the encoding quality, so they don't let you get really high quality. Most of them throttle the encoding speed, so you're sitting there waiting longer than you have to, and all of them throttle the CD burning speed to 2x. Now, why do they do this? They do this so that you give them more money to buy a pro version that takes away these restrictions, usually about $30. Well, we're going to change all this today with something we call iTunes. <laughs> As I mentioned, we're late to this party, and we're about to do a leapfrog. Because instead of having to put up with this, we're going to give you something that looks like this. Really clean, really simple, 
far more powerful. It allows you to have libraries of music. It allows you to rip CDs. It allows you to create playlists. And it allows you to burn CDs all in one integrated application, all in one window. And let me show this to you now. All right. Here's iTunes. Comes up. Doesn't have any songs in it. So let me go ahead and rip a CD. I'm going to put in uh, an old B-52 CD here. And um, this will read the CD, and it will go to the CD database and get the um, track titles, because those are not on the CD itself. So it'll go over the internet, pull in the track titles. And here we can see we've got the song name, we've got the artist, we've got the album. I can uh, move those around if I want to. And, change them any way I want. I can also sort, uh, uh, well, we'll get to that later. OK, let's go ahead and rip a CD. So let's go ahead and rip uh, Love Shack. So let me go ahead and uh, turn the rest of these off and say I want to rip Love Shack. And all I have to do is push import. And what it's going to do is it's just going to go ahead and rip it and put it in my library. Okay, we just finished ripping that song about eight times normal speed, as fast as the drive would go. And uh, here it is, and here we can play it from disc if we want. So we've ripped the song, very, very simple. Now, you might want to import a bunch of songs, and you could put all your, uh, your discs in, but I've already done that, and I've got a bunch of songs in a folder here. And all I have to do is drag that on top of iTunes, uh, and I've got about uh, a thousand songs. So um, there's a thousand songs just imported. And uh, matter of fact, I've got 1,004 songs in here. And uh, you know that's, that's a pretty big music library. And as I said before, I can sort by song, I can sort by artist, or I can sort by album, just by clicking. And again, I can, you know, I can go play uh, any song just by clicking on it. Pretty simple. But in addition to being able to sort by song or artist or album, I've got a few other ways to do this. I can browse by album, and so I can look at all my albums here, right? And uh, so I can just look at, you know, I can look at the Beatles, and I can see all their albums right here. And, uh, you know, I can pick one here and just get down to let it be, right? Very simple. Let's go to uh, another example, uh, Sarah McLachlan, you know, very simple. So very, very simple. Again, the quality here is incredible because we've got an just a fantastic encoding engine here that does not limit you on bitrate at all. So you can have fantastic quality in this. But there's an even easier way to find things out of my 1,100 songs than browsing by album. We, since we have a library, we've automatically indexed it and made it magic. So let me go find something with Dylan Thomas. I've got a Dylan Thomas recording in here. I can type D-Y-L. I'm already down to 85 songs, A-N. Most of them are Bob Dylan, but I type the T for Thomas, and now I'm down to just Dylan Thomas, you know? You know, so I can just type in anything here, whether it's an artist name or an album name or a song name. So let me type in, let's say I want to find when I'm 64, right? So I'll just type in 60, S-I-X-T, boom, there I am, two songs. Or let's say a Rolling Stones song called Beast of Burden. I could type in stones, and I get all my Rolling Stones. Or I could just type in 
feast, and I get feast to burn. So there's never been anything like this to allow you to find music instantly. It's pretty cool. So let's build a playlist. I go over here and I say I want to build a playlist and I'm going to call it Macworld. And I got my Macworld playlist. Let's go ahead and drag some things in. So let's go ahead and drag in a Sarah McLaughlin song, let's say. Type in Sarah and uh, there's a song called Mystery. There it is, Building a Mystery. We'll throw in that one. And uh, then we'll go to, uh, why don't we find uh, Let It Be. You know, off the Let It Be album, we'll drag in Let It Be. Uh, let's find that B-52 album. Uh, I think let's type in 52. There it is, Love Shack that we just ripped. And, uh, and then let's go uh, and uh, go in here. And we can just grab a whole album if we want to. Uh, I could grab a Bare Naked Ladies album uh, and just uh, drag the whole album to my playlist, and it puts all that in there too. So there's my playlist right there. Pretty simple. And I can build as many playlists as I want. Now... Again, if I want to write a CD, all I have to do is see this button up here called Burn. Watch this. See that? You know? So it's going to ask me to put a disc in. Whoops. I closed it on myself. All right. What am I doing here? All right. There we go. Take out the B-52s, put in a blank CDR disc, and say Burn. I insert a blank disk and it will start burning. All right, there we go. Huh. All right, boom. No? Maybe this is a bum disk. Let's try another one here. All right, there we go. No? I think it's spinning up now. So this is going to just go ahead and burn the CD for me. It's going to burn the whole playlist. I don't want to burn the whole playlist. So I'm going to. Go ahead and stop this. But you get the idea. And it's preparing the tracks now. It's going to take a while. Okay, let me just stop it here. It's going to take me a second to stop it. All right. So here's my playlist. That's how simple it is to burn a CD. And again, in my playlists, I can just move stuff around if I want Love Shack at the top or whatever I want at the bottom. It's very, very simple. Very, very simple. Now, what about um, an MP3 player? Well, I've got an MP3 player right here. And uh, let me just go ahead and turn it on. And I'll put it in the cradle, right? All I have to do is just throw it in its cradle. And when it's connected to a USB port, which all of them are, it just pops up right here. Here's my new MP3 player. And so I can, to get these songs off, all I have to do is click on them and delete, and it'll just erase them off the MP3 player. And uh, to get something onto the MP3 player, like I could just drag Love Shack on, and uh, Love Shack is just uh, copying onto the MP3 player, and I can drag a whole playlist or individual songs, whatever I want. And it's that simple to move things to and from your MP3 player. Boom, there it is. Okay. Now, Let's go to internet radio. I just click on this button and here's all my internet radio stations, right? I'll click on uh, top 40. It's going to go query all the top 40 radio stations out there. Oops. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, let's see here. Here's the top 40 radio stations. I'll pick one called The Wolf because it's got 128 kilobit per second. <laughs> like radio. Okay, so let me go back to my playlist now, and um, I'm going to, uh, I'll just play, uh, I'll play Love Shack here. So here I am listening to music, and uh, I want to do something, you know, I'm doing stuff on my computer, and I don't want this thing taken up. Boom, remembers where it was. Okay, last thing, last thing. Um, 
what if we could see music? What would it look like? We took a stab at it. And uh, built in to iTunes is something that's pretty cool. Let me go ahead and show it to you. You get the idea. So, iTunes, it's pretty remarkable. The visualization just goes on and on and on too. It's unbelievable. So, again, instead of the current players with their restrictions, iTunes is completely unrestricted. Unrestricted encoding into MP3, unrestricted encoding quality and speed, and unrestricted CD burning speed. And it's also fully integrated. It's got a really advanced encoding and burning engines, great sorting and searching, and an awesome visualization. Again, this stuff is pretty amazing. iTunes runs on Mac OS 9, and it's free. You can, you can get it today, and what you do is you go to apple.com and you download it. Now iTunes today will run on almost any Mac, running Mac OS 9. You'll be able to rip CDs, build a library, build playlists, play your music on your computer, transfer your music to your portable MP3 players, listen to internet radio. But the first release today supports only the CDRW and Super Drives that we're shipping in our new towers. We will be adding plugins to support the most popular third-party CDRW drives on the Mac over the next 60 to 90 days. So check back with the download site, and we'll have those there as fast as we can get them tested so that you can burn CDs as well on any Mac running Mac OS 9. All righty. Join the music revolution with iTunes and make your music devices about 10 times more valuable. That's iTunes. <laughs> so what's next? This is something that I have personally dreamed about for a few years now. And uh, it is the completion of a dream that we had several years ago. So I'm extraordinarily 
uh, pleased and moved to be able to announce this to you. The DVD. And DVD players have exploded. There's at least 10 million in the US. Estimates range all the way up to 13 and a half million, and it's, it's doubling every year now. It's expected that the penetration is going to grow from its current 10% of households to 40% of households in the next two and a half years. These are also being used all over the place now in corporations. And what do you want to do? You want to make your own DVDs with your movies instead of the ones you buy at Tower Records. Right? And you want to play them in consumer DVD players. You want to shoot footage on camcorders, consumer or pro-grade. You want to make the movies on your computer, but what you want to keep on going to create the DVD and burn the DVD. And then you want to play it in consumer players. That's what we want to do. There are three hurdles. The first is just burning that DVD disc. If you can't do that, why bother with the other stuff? But if you can, then you've got to encode the data, which is fierce. And then you've got to find a way for, to lay out the content easily, if you're not a pro, or even if you are and you don't have a day. These are the hurdles. So let's go to the first one. Burning the DVD disc, that's the super drive. We've got that one now. That brings us to encoding the data. Encoding the data is rough because to fit a big movie onto just one disc, they use fierce compression called MPEG-2, Motion Picture Encoding Group 2. And this encoding is very, very fierce computationally. There's two ways to do it, hardware and software. To get decent quality, which you really want, the hardware cost at least $1,000, and most pros use hardware up to $5,000. Now that doesn't work for us. We don't want to add that much money to our computers. So we focused on software. The software side, encoding and software, though actually higher quality than the hardware, is very slow. How slow? It's 25, it takes 25 times as long as the source material. So if you want to encode an hour DVD, it'll take you a day of your computer chugging away. If you want to encode 30 minutes, it'll take you 12 and a half hours. That's a long time. Well, we've had a technical breakthrough. We asked some of our scientists to look at this, and they came up with something sweet. Using the velocity engine on the G4, they've been able to reduce the encoding time for very high quality encoding from 25 times to two times. So, you can encode, you can encode and do all the calculations to lay out the data on a DVD in 2x. So if you have a 30 minute disc, it takes an hour instead of 12 and a half hours. So we now, because of this technical breakthrough, know how to encode the data in a very high quality way in a cost efficient manner. Which leads to, how do we easily lay out the content? There are some programs that professionals use that allow them to make the DVDs we buy at Tower Records. But most of our customers, even our pro customers, don't want to learn how to use those programs. They're pretty fierce. Because most of them actually want to use DVD as a transport, not as a final product. Ad agencies want to show their clients ads in a much higher quality way, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, when we bring it down to the personal level, none of us could use those pro programs. So we've got to come up with something that's truly a breakthrough. And we have. It's called iDVD. <laughs> iDVD is revolutionary. And I, I don't know what words to use to describe it to you, so I've just got to show it to you now. Mobile computing. <laughs> All righty. Let's make a DVD, shall we? Let me launch iDVD. <laughs> oh, 
open a new project. Save it as Macworld, why not? Okay, this is iDVD. It is a single window application. Let me change the title of it to Macworld. Now, when you're going to make a DVD, there's a ton of stuff that you have to do to lay out the data just right, and the program knows how to do all that. But there's also a part that you have to get right, which is laying out the menus. It's pretty complicated. And most people aren't graphic artists. They don't, wanna, they don't know how to necessarily make DVDs. So let me show you how we do this. I've got some movies here, some iMovies, some Final Cut movies, etc. So I'm going to just drag one on, one we've used before. Boom. I'm DVD just made a button for me. It labeled it beach. I think I'll uh, label it, uh, you know, at the beach maybe. And um, I want to put a picture in here for the thumbnail so I remember what that is. So I could go get the movie out, an iMovie in this case, and take a frame and put it in Photoshop and do this and do that. Let's not do that. I just click on it here, and the slider pops up, and I can scroll through every frame in the movie, and I can grab one and put it right there. Right? Simple. OK, now, here's another video from Amy Mann. She's really hot right now. And I just drop it on. Boom. iDVD just made two buttons. Swing Dance. This is a movie, an iMovie that was made by one of our employees. It's truly wonderful. Yeah, for her grandparents called Swing Dance. And again, I've got three movies laid out. Now, I can actually move these around and change the order however I want to. No big deal. Change the titles, etc. I could put up to six things on here. What if six isn't enough? Huh. I have submenus. I add a folder. It puts four things on here. And I'm going to call this one Cool Stuff. Boom. Now, to get down into that folder, I just click it. And again, Cool Stuff. Great. So I'm going to put another movie on here. This is a fun movie. This, what movie is this? <laughs> I grabbed it from the Maya guys, right? So there's that one. And then I'm going to put a great movie on here called Gravity. This is another interesting thing. See, making a DVD isn't just important to pros, and it isn't just important to us personally. It's huge for education. Their ability to capture best practices and send them around the districts, their ability to capture students doing wonderful things as they learn and share them is unparalleled. I'm going to play you this movie now that we got. This is a real movie from one of, our, uh, one of the schools that we serve. Hi, my name is Galileo. And my name is Aristotle. Today we're going to be talking about our theories about gravity. And all we're going to be using is a book and a few pieces of paper. Aristotle said that heavier objects like this book fall faster than lighter objects like this paper. And Galileo think that, uh, thinks that objects fall at the same rate regardless of how much they weigh. What do you think will happen when we drop this book and this paper? You get the idea. <laughs> OK. So you notice iDVDs also put the navigation arrows in for me. Simple. So I'm back up here with cool stuff. And I'm going to add another folder. Uh, that I'm going to call, let's say we're an ad agency and we want to share some ads with our clients. And I'll go into ads now. And I'll change this to a portfolio. And I'll just drag in some ads. I've got uh, our Sage iMac ad. And I grabbed an ad from our ad agency. They do work for Nissan. And then I've got old 1984 here I put on here. And so again, I can just click into these things, you know, watch them. The day we the you know that ad. And, uh, and so now I go back, and I can take these folders, this cool stuff, and I can pick any one of the thumbnails, you know, the Maya or that thumbnail. And in the ads, I can pick any one of the thumbnails. So I'll just pick, you know, 1984. And then the last thing I'm going to add here, and of course, I can have folders within folders. So I can have infinite, not infinite, but I can have a very deep nest of folders if I want. And now, I can add a slideshow. Watch this. Slideshow, let me go back. Let me grab some photos. Right? I can just drag a photo in and boom, right? Let me add, drag all these in. Just adds all the photos, boom. I can look at them big or small. I can rearrange them in here, the order. Do anything I want. I just, you know, boom, boom, boom. And there's all my photos. Right? So now, and I can again just, you know, go through here and, you know, grab one. It's that simple. And then what I can do is, of course, I can preview 
my DVD if I want, right? I can go like this, and I can go around, and I can play this movie. <laughs> Okay, you know, and I can go to this one. This one's great too. So I can make sure that my DVD is just right before I want to burn it. But there might be more stuff I want to do. What if, I mean, this, this look is really nice. It's kind of a pro look. But what if I want to do something a little more personal? Well, we have themes. So I can say, great, well, let's, let's make it a, you know, a green one or even a lavender one here. But I've got some much more fun ones. I can make it a chalkboard. And look at that. It changed the buttons, the font, the background, boom, all at the same time. And it still works exactly the same. You know? Nothing different. Or I can go in, I can say, you know, that's really nice, but let's make it a photo album. Again, buttons change, everything changes, fonts change, all pre programmed in. This is a fun one for a road trip. Look at that, isn't that great? <laughs> you know? And I can go through this, is a good one for, a, you know, again, a personal one, but isn't that wonderful? You can make. DVDs like this, way beyond the graphic arts capability of most of us mere mortals, in just a few seconds. Right? We've even got them, you know, refrigerator magnets. <laughs> and even things like a wedding, as an example, you know, which we're not having today. So, I'm going to stick with graphite for this one, and I'm going to go down uh, into this submenu, and I think I'm going to change this one to my chalkboard like that, and uh, I think I'll go down into this submenu, and I think I'm going to change this one, I'll change it to the portfolio, all right? So we've got our DVD, and I can even, if I don't see anything I love here, I can make custom stuff. I can, uh, if this is an Amy Mann video, I can just drag a photo on here and change the background like that, or like that, or like that. Or like that. And I can also go in here to themes and I can go to custom and I can customize things. So, as an example, I can make that title on the top white and make it bigger and I can make, uh, you know, change fonts. I can do whatever I really want to here and I can make the buttons different too. I can, you know, make them ovals if I want to or I can even uh, make them splash buttons here if I want to. You know, whatever I really want to do. And, uh, and I can save these custom things. But for now, I'm just going to make a standard DVD. Now, I can see that I've got about 12 minutes of video here, and if I was going to make a DVD for you, it would take me about, you know, uh, 2x that, about 25 minutes, and we don't have the time for that right now. So I made one yesterday, and uh, I'm going to show it to you. This is a $250 consumer DVD player. I pop the disc in. Let's take a look at it. Boom, there it is. And we can go ahead and play some, uh, play some videos if we want to. You can see the quality.
This is the kind of stuff you can do now. You, you can, that video was created with iMovie, and now it can be sent to the grandparents to watch on their DVD. It's unbelievable. So again, has a lot of applications in science as well. Here we're in a submenu now, right? Let's take a look at that Maya video, right? Or we can go back and take a look at uh, Galileo and Aristotle again. Hi, my name is Galileo, and my name is Aristotle. So today we know. Thank you. <laughs> and last thing I want to show you, we got some fun ads and stuff, but the last thing I want to show you is a slideshow. This is a whole new way to transmit and view photography. Look at this. Look at these photos. These are regular digital photos on a DVD. Unbelievable. Watching these things on a television set is just unbelievable quality. A whole new way to deal with digital photographs. Put them on a DVD. Cute kids, huh? Okay. So, this is iDVD. Mm. We think this is revolutionary. And you can get video from any source that can generate a QuickTime file iMovie, Final Cut Pro, Adobe Premiere, Avid, anything. And iDVD can make a DVD very quickly. Also, you can get source material from digital cameras. This is huge. You can have thousands of digital photographs on a DVD. And as you can see, you can mix them with video. So we think this is huge. The ability to make these DVDs to rapidly build the menus, to customize how they work and how they look, to have digital photography, it's huge, we think. And we're going to bundle iDVD with SuperDrive so that everybody that buys a computer with a SuperDrive in it gets iDVD. And of course, iMovie is bundled with every machine we make. So iDVD. Now, when you're done, when you're done, writing, when you're done creating your DVD, you want to write it. And we're going to be selling media too. DVD-R media. Apple certified. We have a breakthrough price of $10 each. So we're going to be selling a five pack of media for $49.95. That's $10 each to be able to write these DVDs. That is a total breakthrough price. And when you're done writing your DVD, you can play it on any one of the 10 million players in the US, it's a breakthrough. And we think iDVD is going to add dramatic value to DVD players everywhere. But it's even beyond that because we're starting to link multiple devices together. Digital camera with digital hub to, uh, to DVD player. Digital camera to digital hub to DVD player. And we think this is going to be huge. We're also announcing a new professional tool here today. As you know, we sell Final Cut Pro that's taking the pro video editing market by storm. And of course, you can use iDVD to make DVDs from Final Cut Pro. But today, we're also introducing a new pro product called DVD Studio Pro for our pro customers that is a complete professional DVD authoring tool. It's remarkable. It blows away the tools available, costing five to $10,000 a piece. We're going to sell it for $995, just like Final Cut Pro. It'll be available at the end of January. DVD Studio Pro is the perfect complement to Final Cut Pro for our pro customers. So our vision, we don't think the PC's dying. We think it's evolving. It's gone from the prehistoric times to its first golden age of productivity to its second golden age, the internet age, now entering its third golden age, the digital lifestyle age. 
where it will become the digital hub of these amazing new digital devices. And it will become the digital hub because it can do things that these digital devices just can't do. Run complex applications like iMovie, iTunes, iDVD. Big screen for the user interfaces we need to do these things and to make it simple to burn disks, CDs, and now DVDs, and large inexpensive storage. And it can talk to the internet any way, any speed. We think this is going to be huge. And the glue that's going to make all this happen are the applications. And we are working on even more. iMovie, iTunes, iDVD. They are going to be our passport into this new digital lifestyle era. And that is where we are going. So, you guys have sat through a lot, and I really appreciate it today. And uh, there is one more thing. <laughs> one more thing, if I could uh, beg your patience, another few minutes. I'll give you a clue. Anybody get it? Remember high school chemistry? Okay. Let's talk notebooks. We have the most powerful notebooks in the world. But they have the sex. Right? They have the sex. We want both. <laughs> we want both. The power and the sex. Right? So today we're introducing a totally new power book. It's got the power. 500 megahertz G4, our first G4 power book ever. If that's not enough, this next one's gonna blow your mind. 15.2 inch mega wide <laughs> Built in DVD. Five hour battery life. Airport ready. So these are the kind of power features you'd expect from us. Firewire ports, etc., etc. All that stuff. But what about the sex? <laughs> Sitting down? <laughs> One inch thick. One inch thick. 5.3 pounds. And this again. What is this? Titanium. It's made out of titanium. Like the spy planes. This, this is an incredible material. It's stronger than steel, yet lighter than aluminum. It's unbelievable. And this isn't, you know, IBM's talked about titanium, but they just throw a little titanium powder into their plastic. It's nothing. This is real commercial grade titanium metal like they build airplanes out of. Titanium. We think we got the power and the sex in our new PowerBook G4 Titanium. And as you can see, I'd like to show it to you. <laughs> this thing's pretty remarkable. Ready? Voila. Got video here? There we go. This is it. It is remarkable. Let me open it here. Look at this. It's incredible. Let me just show you how thin this is. That's my finger. Okay? I want you to go down and show them the side. Look at this thing. It's unbelievably beautiful. You and about a billion other people. This thing 
is incredible. Here's the DVD slot load drive in the front that you can see. Yeah, very nice. 15.2 inch mega wide screen. Unbelievable. An inch thick. That's it. We've been working on this for a while. And now let me show you this way. Unbelievable mega wide screen. So let me show you a little bit more. Because we've got uh, a TV ad we've been working on. So let me scooch this out of the way here. And uh, the best way to show you is just to show you this new ad, I think. Let's roll it. We got a totally new design from the ground up. It's an inch thin. It's just really wonderful. This screen is so unbelievable. 15.2 inch mega wide screen. The border around that screen is unbelievably thin. When you move your cursor up to the edge, you're afraid it's going to fly off. <laughs> and the screen is gorgeous. Full size keyboard, best keyboard we've ever shipped on a portable. Slot low DVD. So you don't have that tray coming out and you're knocking your cup off the tray under your lap in the airplane. And as you can see, we turn the logo around so when it opens, the logo's right side up. So now, let's take a look at the back. We got a door here with all our connectors on, Firewire, USB, uh, VGA video out, S video out, 100 megabit per second Ethernet, IRDA, everything's on there. And on the bottom, we've got a battery, five-hour battery life off this one removable battery. It's unbelievable. We have airport antennas built into both sides for incredible airport range. Power Mac G4, or Power Mac G4, the new PowerBook G4. Two models. They both share a G4 processor, one megabyte of L2 cache. Rage Mobility 128 graphics, the fastest graphics going in portables, 8 megabytes of graphics memory, two USB ports, a FireWire port, Ethernet, modem, airport, VGA, S-Video, 4 and 500 megahertz, both share the 15.2 inch screen, 128 megabytes and 256 megabytes, 10 and 20 gigabyte drives, configurable up to 30 if you want to do a BTO, slot load DVD in both of them, $25.99, $34.99. The new PowerBook G4 is Mac OS X ready. It's fully configured and certified. When can I get one? We are in the production ramp right now. We will be shipping in a few weeks, and you can get one by the end of January. Now, where do we stand on power and sex? Well, for power, let's look at Final Cut Pro. It's a really good power app. It runs beautifully on this machine. It takes full advantage of the mega-wide screen. It's unbelievable. It is the ultimate portable video editing studio. But how does it compare to its predecessor? Because of the new architecture and the G4 chip, Final Cut Pro runs 60% faster on the new PowerBook G4 than on its predecessor. Much faster, a lot of power, the fastest notebook in the world. But let's go back to the sex. How do we compare not just to other notebooks, because we obviously toast them, but to sub notebooks like the Sony Vio? Sub notebooks that are not designed to have built in drives or big screens or run for five hours, they make those compromises to be thin and sexy. So, how do we compare to those? Well, let's take a look. The most popular Vio. $2,549. It's $50 cheaper. Let's see what $50 can buy. Number one, a dramatically bigger screen. 
from 12.1 to 15.2. How much bigger is that? Well, that's the bio screen. Right there. And if you calculate it, ours is 52% larger. 52% is what it buys you. Well, my God, there must be an error on this slide. <laughs> no, there is not. The new PowerBook G4 is thinner than the Vio Sub Notebook. Unbelievable. <laughs> they are 15% thicker than the new PowerBook G4 at 1.15 inches thick for the Vio. And of course, they're made out of last year's material. <laughs> they have a P3 running at 650. We totally toast them with our G4. They have no optical drive. For $50 less, they have none, not even a CD, none. We have a slot load DVD built in. Battery life, five hours versus two hours. And no wireless options. PowerBook G4 is wireless ready, just pop it in an airport card. So, some people think this is the sexiest portable around. We don't anymore. We think the new Power Mac G4 is absolutely where it's at for power and sex. New PowerBook G4 titanium. <laughs> so, we made a video about the PowerBook, and let me go ahead and run it now.
So, a lot of people at Apple have been working pretty hard lately. We got some great new stuff today. Mac OS X, which we'll be shipping this quarter. A monumental effort by our software group, headed by Avi Tavania. New Power Mac G4, fastest Mac in history, fastest desktop on the planet, CDRW drive standard, new super drive, first of its kind in the world, shipping next month. A new strategy focused on the next great era of PCs, the digital lifestyle era, driven by applications like iMovie and our two new ones today, iMusic available today, iDVD bundled with the SuperDrive that is going to change everything about how we listen to music and about how we deal with video. And lastly, a new power book that is the coolest, sexiest notebook on the planet as well as being the most powerful. Our teams have been very busy and I'd like you to join me in giving a round of applause to the software team, to the hardware team, They've been working very hard. Avi and his team on software, John Rubenstein and his team on hardware, Sina Tamadan and his team on applications. And their teams have done some just work I am so, so proud to be sharing with you today. So that's what we have for you today. We've got a great booth with all this stuff out there. Go get your hands on this stuff. Thank you very much.